Welcome, everybody, back to our interview marathon 2022-23. Uh, I, I told you we'd be having some really big names today, and I'm very, very happy to have somebody here with me that I'm a huge fan of because he is one of the craziest live performers I've ever seen. Noah Landis, thanks for joining. Thank you. Good so, to meet you. Yeah, so uh, as usual, I always ask our interview partners, what is the band merch, band shirt, whatever that you're wearing today? So you can either that's... pluck your own stuff or what do you mm, have? No, that's a great, that's a great, um, what we call an icebreaker. Because uh, I think it says a lot about somebody sort of um, uh, identity that they project into the world is like the yes. clothes that they have in their closet and what they choose to put on every day. Like so what is yours? Okay, so mine here. You know what I could do? I realize I'm I'm reversed. So let me um let me unreverse it. Uh this is a uh, sweatshirt from a a group called uh Against the Stream. And it's a Buddhist meditation society that okay. um I don't know if you've heard of this but it's called Dharma Punks. I've heard and it's the, a, track, the, the name, yes. It's a, it's a, uh, there's a book. Yes. Basically, it's a, um, it's a group of people like me who are a bit older, who have been through a lot in life, who are looking for new ways to kind of um, move through the world without making everything so damn hard, like I have in my own personal life and past so it's kind of like punk rock meditation group that Sounds that awesome. meets once a week um mm -hmm. look on the back i don't know if you can see it meditate and meditate destroy. and oh, meditate and destroy that's a cool that's a cool right? thing yes all right so um anyway that's something that i've gotten into it's um if you don't mind me talking about it just for a moment no it's um uh designed for people who are maybe in recovery for something whether it's alcohol or drug addiction or trauma or people who um you know suffer from anxiety and depression and these are these are tools that we have that we can use to um to sort of help navigate that path so it's maybe perhaps less painful you know mm -hmm. um and so uh one of the things they do use is uh is rather than alcoholic uh, Al alcohol anonymous which is a you know international yeah. strategy for that this is a different one called refuge recovery and what mm -hmm. it does is it incorporates a lot of sort of buddhist philosoph philosophy and a lot of mindfulness ideas and so it's just kind of an alternative to to sort of ways of changing um, maybe unhealthy patterns of behavior. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that if that makes sense. It does, but let me ask a question concerning that. Does it also, first of all, show you negative and destructive forms of behavior that somebody has used over the last couple of whatever? years months decades no i think it's for people who have their own experience through that mm -hmm. and have reached a place where they understand uh it's almost like a recognizing that they have been deeply unhappy mm -hmm. because i would say in my experience and i've worked with young people who who also are in treatment for for addiction and um, depression and anxiety. Addiction is an expression of depression and anxiety. Yes, right? definitely. It's, it's definitely. like a response to these things that are sort of like yeah. tearing us up inside. And it's yeah. a way that we can do the best we can to sort of move through the world and face the day, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, rather than it being its own disease, I see it as a an expression of these other um you know mental health challenges 
Mm-hmm. You know, I and know in, what you mean. That way, I, I, I would also would... add to that, if I may, that of course, addiction is addiction, and addiction can be a pure addiction after some point. I, I see that on in in daily life with my mom, who is has been struggling with cigarette addiction for mm-hmm. five decades now. And I think she has come to a point where that thing is a real addiction. But I totally agree with you. In the very first phases, every addiction is an expression of, how shall I say? It's like a coping mechanism, right? So you yeah. are having problems with coping with your everyday life. Okay, you grab a cigarette and you puff on it and you basically have something to hold on to, even though the thing couldn't even hold anything, but you have something to hold on to and to get through the day, just like you said. And yeah. if I may yeah. add a question to that, because uh, having followed you already for a long time, not stalking you, following you, <laughs> uh, on, on Facebook, I've seen that you are involved with something that is called Rock Ivor 4 or 2 Recovery. Does that go into that direction as well? Yeah, Rock to Recovery was originally started for people who were in alcohol and drug treatment programs. And yep. what what we do in this group um, is we show up with the instruments. Mm-hmm. And we sit down with a group of people who are not musicians, who've never played music before, and we show them whatever instrument they want to play, just enough so that we could write a song together. Mm -hmm. And then we and then we write words together and Mm -hmm. and we try to keep it real. And it's a Mm -hmm. way for them to um, to express in a creative way the shit that they're going through. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And. um, um it's very healing it's it's actually shown to be um just have all kinds of benefits sorry let me turn this off no problem um i actually i i stopped doing the rock to recovery a little while ago it was very rewarding but also very draining I was working with um, a lot of uh, teenagers, 15 year olds Mm -hmm. who were, um, you know, just starting out in life and sort of having a hard time. And each one of them has done something and I don't know what it was, but something so extreme that their parents sent them to a, a, what we call residential treatment center where they actually live, right? Mm And um, I was just one of many of the programs that would come in there and sort of try to help them with what they're going through. Um, I could meet them where they are. Mm-hmm. I can recognize them because I'm, I've, I was that kid and I still sort of am that kid, you know? Um, and uh, it was nice to be the one adult in their lives who wasn't telling them to sit down and don't do that Mm -hmm. and shut up and do this. Right. And that's what they get all day long is somebody barking at them. And I was, I was, you know, able to connect with them in a way because in some ways I'm one of them. Right. I cannot say yes or no, but I I know what you mean. Yes. Yeah. Um, And I also have to admit that, saving a little bit of your inner child is something that I always think of one of the goals for life, because yes. my wife would also say the same, like I'm I, at the bottom of my heart. I'm still a kid. Yes. Um, <laughs> and when we're talking about younger versions of ourselves, I think that's a good point to put forth the following question. And with that also going to one of the reasons why we're having this interview your your latest band, whose name I will not tell, but I have to ask, is the punk Noah Tension Spam back? Uh, I've always been, <laughs> I've always been here, man. I, I didn't go anywhere. Um, but you know what I mean, right? I I, I just saw yeah. it. it your, the band name struck something in me, and I was like, wait, I've I've heard that before. 
And then I looked a little, looked it up a little bit, and I've seen that you definitely duck puns like that in the '90s and '80s, right? I think, yeah, I think um, it was the band Econochrist who gave me that name uh, okay. when I recorded one of their records back in the '90s. Mm-hmm. But it's, I mean, I have a name that lends itself to, yeah, um, you know, um, yeah. Uh, and you know, one thing I'll say about that is that back then, these are these are um, Christ on Parade days for me, which was the yeah. band I started in 1985 and played yeah. in until through 1990, yeah. right? With, with Duck and all the others, yes. Yeah. Now, Christ on Parade was a band that, like, while we sang about some very serious topics, yeah. Um, we actually had a good sense of humor um, yeah. at the same time. And and that's sort of like one of the ways that we chose to not take ourselves too seriously yeah. or to maybe give a balance to the seriousness of the things that we were writing music about, right? Yeah. Which were, you know, had to do with um, animal rights and, um, and sort of... Um, uh oppressive society um and normality and expectations of who we're supposed to be in the world and yeah. and writing music and lyrics that were outwardly defying that you know yeah. but then at the same time we were able to um i don't know well one thing is like we didn't care to put our real names on any of our records or yeah, even our photos because right. it was it was not about that at all it was yeah. actually we would prefer to be anonymous you know yeah for, for um, everybody who's something... not who, for everybody who's not that familiar with christ on parade uh we're talking about four guys who basically named themselves duck my own grave t ott malcolm van halen and noah lowens <laughs> So that's what I, I turned. I turned I, eighteen. I love that. Yeah, I love, that. <laughs> I, I love the names. Um, but uh, I also un- totally understand what what you're talking about. Um, that is also something that I think some of the political bands that came later were lacking. I mean, mm-hmm. like it is very important, and I, I guess you agree with that. It's very important to be serious on your topics, but it doesn't mean that you should be serious about yourself. Yeah. Yeah, where there there should be some kind of balance and and how we how we move through the world, you know. Yeah. Um, I try to, you know, I think I could be rather intense a lot of the time, and so that's mm-hmm. one of the things that maybe I still need to work on a little bit is to lighten up, mm-hmm. you know, at times, you know. And back then in our youth, it's easier to, because everything is sort of a, you know, a celebration of our, of our friendships and our camaraderie and our punk community. And, um, you know, and there's a lot of partying going on. Um, And then as we get older, um, I'm 53 years old now. So um, So you're a little older than me with my 44. (laughs) <laughs> things could take a little bit more of a serious turn sometimes and yeah. in, in just sort of with life and loss and experience. Um, it's, it's, I guess, a reason why a lot of people always try to like, they remember their youth so fondly and they always try to like put that old band back together and yeah, yeah, keep yeah. it going for as long as possible, you know? Yeah. So I've got mixed feelings on that. I, I musically, I've always tried to just move forward, never try to go back and mm-hmm. re, you know, make an album twice. <laughs> I know what you mean. Um, um, but uh, but I do have a fond um, affection for what life felt like back then you know it was a different time the punk scene was very different um it was fresh and being it was being created every day by us in the moment you know and i don't know that it feels differently for young people today but 
part of me feels like it will never be what that was again. Well, I guess in some ways you're you're very right on that because um, being a teacher, I also see that, well, being a teenager nowadays seems to be so different from what you and I experienced in the 80s and 90s and late 70s in your case probably, but you know what I mean, right? So we, we had a different childhood and... Um, I don't know if I shall envy them or whether I shall be very, very happy for what we had. Um, to also clue up for those who still haven't gotten it, uh, Noah's latest band is called Tension Span. Um, and I don't know if it is a real reference to the name that Iconocrist gave you. Is it? Noah. Tension span. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's it's the source of it, but no, it's not. Um, uh, you know, coming up with a band name is actually a challenging thing to do. Um, at some point, it doesn't matter what the name is. It's yeah. the sound that people associate with your group. But um, Definitely. but uh, you want to do your best. Um, I guess I don't love uh, bands that are named after puns, um, but you know there is there is a tension in the music and a tension in the yeah. in the the sort of vibe and aesthetic yeah. of of the music that we're making. So it seemed like a fitting a fitting thing, yeah. and um, maybe it's something that will stick in people's minds because it's just a play on the word attention span so it's yeah it, it definitely is um even though one should be very clear that when listening to tension span we're not listening to a band of 13 23 year olds or something like that you know with who maybe like listened to some of the influences that are being incorporated in your sound you have not been listening to that for three or four years you've been listening to that for 30 years maybe a little bit yeah. more so in that case yeah. you definitely do not have a short attention span uh maybe vice versa one could even add, say you know like uh, some of the sounds that you're making here i have a feeling as if i have been brooding inside of you for a little while i think that's fair to say i think um in some ways, I've been um, expressing the same emotion through music and through punk music for my whole life. I mean, since I was just old enough to discover what punk rock was, you know, um, and um and my take on it has always been actually kind of more, even in Christ on Parade, the songs I was writing, it was more of a personal introspection of what, of expressing what, what it feels like to live in a society where you don't feel like you belong, right? Mm -hmm. Where, where you make a conscious choice and an effort to walk on the outside of the path that most people are walking down the middle of, right? Mm -hmm. And um, what what that feels like to um, to feel alienated in that way, um, to to um, be in touch with your own stress and fear and anxiety that exists in the world and to harness that and to, to sort of release it through this conduit of music mm -hmm. um, with, with all of the sort of um, true raw emotion. Uh, I think that's a very healing thing to do. Um, but that's sort of, um, I, in some ways, you're right. Over the last 35 years, it's what I've been 
I've been kind of on that same path in, in various projects, various bands and different sort of lyrical approaches and musical approaches. But in some ways it all, it it's, it's sort of like an exercise in existentialism or something, or like, it's, it's like trying to put back into the world something that's true about who I am and what I'm, what I'm made of and what my when experience you, is, you know. When you say that um, you are trying to put something into the world that is you, um, while I was doing my research for this interview, I saw that there had been musical productions and musical releases of yours that seemed to have been done before Christ on Parade. For example, uh, I'm not sure if I looked it up correctly, but could it be that Youth Authority, of which two songs have been published on um, several San Francisco fanzine records, or however we want to call them, tapes, uh, was Youth Authority your first venture into recording music? Probably. I don't know that you could actually call it recording music. It was just... Well, it has been released. Me. It must have been recorded. Yeah, but <laughs> recorded on maybe a, you know, a, a boombox in the practice room, right? Um, yeah. Because we were kids. You know, we were kids. Yeah, of course. Uh, if I was... If I was 15 when I started Christ on Parade, I must have been 13 or 14 with Youth Authority. Now, Youth My Authority goodness. is a name that um, in in the United States, it's a name that we use for juvenile hall. It's like okay, a yeah. detention center for troubled yeah, yeah, kids. Yeah, it's yeah. who break the law. They go to Youth Authority. <laughs> um, uh, but so that that... Uh, recording was um, kept alive by uh, an old childhood friend of mine named Aaron Elliott, who yeah. uh, is known as Aaron Comet Bus. Who also released the, those re those tapes, right? Yeah, he was. Uh, he's my age, and we grew up together. And while we were sort of learning our instruments and forming bands, he was documenting everything at that early age, 13, 14 years old. He was going to punk shows with a camera and a notepad, and he was writing scene reports um, and documenting all of the cool, creative stuff that was happening in the punk movement in the very early days. And so he never threw anything away. So he's like the uh, the archivist of all of that stuff of my youth and um, all of you know all the people that I grew up with that, who have gone on to do big things like you know my friend you know Dave Edwardson from Neurosis is like my best friend since the first day of high school right but I also went to high school with Jesse Michaels who ended who who became the singer for Operation Ivy. Yeah. And uh, Tim and Matt, who became, you know, from Operation Ivy, became Rancid. Rancid. And um, Jake Sales uh, had uh, Filth and um, um, and Jesse Luscious had Blatz. And these are all people who have kind of like grown up to have big, long lives and stories and accomplishments in the in our little world of punk rock. So um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but, uh, but, but yeah, so Aaron Comet Bus, um, we all owe him a, a bit of a, of a recognition for being the one person at such an early age who took notes and, um, and uh, kept a historical record of all the things that we were doing back then. So when you're talking about all the things that you were doing back then, I guess one of the things that you did also a lot was, of course, listening to music. And when I listened to Tension Span's record, 
I I always feel as if it's a somewhat completely unfitting comparison, but it, I always feel like it's a mix or a cross between Dead Kennedys and Killing Joke. Is that something where you would say, okay, you totally wrong, or where you would say, yeah, those were kind of influences on us? Well, that's interesting. Um, definitely the Killing Joke um, reference feels closer to the truth for me. Mm -hmm. um, Dead Kennedys were, I mean, they were a local band for us since the very beginning. Um, and it's worth mentioning that both of those bands are what I call singular bands, meaning yep. nobody else sounds like them. No. Maybe people have tried, but nobody else sounds like Killing Joke or Dead Kennedys. And there's a, the, there's a list we could go through, maybe a diff, different interview of bands like that, that are just their own thing. Like, yeah. I don't know, Devo is that way or, yeah. or, you know, Joy Division Bungle. or The Cure, like things like that. Like nobody yeah. sounds like them. So it's a short list actually. Um, it is a short uh, list. Most, mu most music is sort of in a genre following the formula you know but the ones that stand out as special are the singular bands so um and i would like to think that tension span is also um while we have uh maybe we conjure an idea of dark punk from that certain time that we also have our own unique sound but uh, well, i'll leave that for the listener to decide <laughs> Well, you definitely have a very recognizable sound. And one part of that is also, of course, your vocals, um, which I, I had to look it up, uh, have been dormant. You know, you haven't done a lot of frontman singing for several years, if I take that, or or at least you have not released yeah. anything like that. Like that. That's true. Um, who would you take more of a of of a compliment? If I said Jello Biafra or uh, Jazz Coleman, what would be more of a compliment? Jazz Coleman. Um, you know, and I don't want to, you know, questions that are set up that way are sort of uh, meant to be divisive. And so I'd Let's rather... Let's not say divisive. I, I would mm -hmm. rather think of it as like, who who is more of an idol and i think or what means idol idol is wrong but who is more of an influence but in, in that case i i don't want to call any kind of divisiveness up here but yeah um it's a way that well let's you see. know personal um, influences is always something very personal and uh, that's nothing with just yeah. divisiveness well one of my biggest influences for 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 um lyrics mm -hmm. Uh, is actually Dick Lucas from Subhumans. Okay. The English uh, band. band. One of the first ones, yeah. yeah. Um, where I felt like he was somebody who tackled a lot of these big um, issues that are, you know, common threads in a lot of punk rock, but he did it in a way that was... Um, not just sort of true, um, but also in in using words in ways that were clever and um, mm -hmm. and uh, sort of thought provoking things that kind of stick in your mind. They wrote the song "From the Cradle to the Grave," which just follows a person's life through mm -hmm. through this world, and that's exactly the song that kind of like I think my brain completely related to that um mm -hmm. and um yeah so he's 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 one of the influences and you know what if i'm like being totally honest another influence for me is actually roger waters Ooh. and the songs that he was uh writing like the wall pink floyd mm -hmm. the wall of course all about identity crisis and um insanity the way that 
happens inside of us when we are um, doing our best in a world that is sort of crushing us, right? And mm-hmm. I think that's that's a sentiment that I have felt a lot in my punk rock life. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's what I mean. It's like, yeah, there's there's a Jello Biafra has a sort of a more literal um, and political take when he's writing songs. Yeah, and very my, straightforward, right? Yeah, and my approach has always been more kind of internal, introspective describe what's happening emotionally yeah right and so that's the difference and i feel like jazz coleman does that as well um and just because you brought you brought up killing joke you know but um but yeah that's um that's sort of what i do um that's kind of my approach to um heavy emotional expressive music mm-hmm. you know and and you know even in neurosis it's not it's not literal it's no. more no. El- elemental and poetic uh, but it conjures an emotion and it conveys something sort of deep within the heart you know um and so that's always been the path that i've taken when when you talk about poetical expressions i know that you like E.E. E. Cummings' works, um, which I find very interesting because, of course, when we talk about E.E. E. Cummings, the poet, then that's something totally different than talking about E.E. E. Cummings, the person who later on also became a supporter of McCarthy, right? So, uh, yeah. So, E.E. E. Cummings, um, is it the free form? that he used that appeals to you? Well, let me first say that I'm not a scholar on E.E. E. Cummings. No, no, no. That's, but you see, that you have po- to, yeah, you go on. The, the poem that I reference in the lyric of that song was one that I heard at a young age. And mm-hmm. it was one of those things that just stuck with me as, as um, so brutal and so sad and so true right yeah. the line is is uh pity this busy monster man unkind, unkind. yeah right and um and i feel like i mean i'm sure you have things that you sort of came across in your uh youthful open-mindedness that really resonated with you and stuck with you this was Definitely. just one of those things right yeah and and i feel like now more than any time before in history we are that busy monster yeah we we are man unkind we are we are living in a in a society where kindness is not valued actually definitely brutality is re- rewarded yeah and and self absorption right and so now what we have we are these monsters busily creating content for our social media to show the world how self absorbed we are and how cool and, we are right yeah like and and everything's just like let me pat myself on the back for every little friggin' thing I did today. And I just, um, I just, it's, I think it's interesting that E.E. E. Cummings says to pity, pity this busy monster. Um, I don't know that we're deserving of pity. <laughs> That is a very true thought there. I'm I'm just writing something down uh, before I forget it. Um, that is a very true thought. You know, when is that? I think that's also something that is in the music of Tension Span, right? So we have come to a point where, first of all, we shouldn't think as if we're superior to any other age in human history. Second of all, 
we shouldn't feel as if we deserve being helped because first of all we've done too much damage to ourselves to our planet to our children so we don't deserve pity right in a way yeah um i think we're on the same page with that um I don't know. A uh, part of some some little approach that I took on the tension span of lyrics. Now, keep in mind, this was a band that I was invited into mm. by Mouse and by Jeff Evans, who are just old friends of mine from the punk community for many decades. You know, um, Mouse was in Dystopia. Jeff was in um, Skaven. Skaven and Asunder, um, you know, we we're young people playing this dark punk music throughout the 90s. I'm a little older than them, so I started sooner. But um, but during the pandemic, they were they were sharing riffs and music ideas back and forth through the internet, and they started to put these songs together, and they and they realized that what they were what what they were doing was touching this old dark punk sound well uh it, you know and it made them think of me because of my work in christ on parade and all the years that we've known each other and they invited me in to be a part of this project which was just kind of going to be a pandemic project for fun uh or for artistic means only right and they said you could do anything you want you could be you could play keyboards and samples you could play guitar and i listened to what they had and i i really liked it i thought it was mostly complete and but what they didn't have was a a voice or mm -hmm. words yeah. or you know some the 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 sort of thoughtful thought-provoking lyrics that that could go with it and i just started to open up my my all of the blocks in in my mind and and started to tap into that thing that i had done so many years ago which is to think about how to express this stuff through words right and through um through voice and through rhythm and repetition and all the things that go into, um, you know, being a, a singer. Um, and uh, I really poured myself into it. And um, I'm actually really proud of the, of what came out. You know, I think it's, it's kind of a new wave of sort of, creative outpouring from me that um i wasn't even looking for in my life but when they when they invited me in that's what happened so would you say that that was maybe something that you completely subconsciously had been looking for without maybe. really looking for it yeah maybe I certainly think a lot. <laughs> so, you know, to have to have a place to put those thoughts was mm. probably something subconsciously that I was looking for, yeah. Where you once again can show or no, not can show, where you once again can give something of you back to the scene. That's a very interesting thing. Um I, I hope nobody is watching that is thinking of two old guys being pensive uh, because we're not. <laughs> I have a question be that is related to what you just said and also something that is related to your band camp page. On your band camp, it says that the band is a pandemic born collaboration. Now you've explained how it got to be, but correct me if I'm wrong, the topics that you are talking about are not only about the pandemic. It's more about like a state of a world address, right? Um, or is it a state of Noah address? 
Well, I would like to think that the things that I'm addressing are more universal than just me, that they're, that they're things that you, my friend, feel and can relate to as well. So there are, there, there are a couple of songs about specific things. There's one um, called Ventilator, which is kind of um, specifically about how divisive this country became with the pandemic and everybody took one side or the other. Either, either you care about other people and you're willing to take to wear a mask and you believe in science and you get a vaccine or you're completely the opposite and everyone else can fuck off and die because your freedom to not do that is more important yeah. than anybody's anything and mm -hmm. that's the was a line drawn down the middle of this country that people chose one side or the other and it's yeah. still that way and it's it's horrible. And I've been alive a long time. I've never seen anything quite like this. Um, the way this, this, this society is divided. Um, so there's one say... song about that. Yeah, you go. There's, a, yeah. there's another song um, that's specifically about the homelessness um, condition mm -hmm. in this yeah. country, which has just... Um, expanded and increased exponentially over the last yeah. five years. We have Definitely. huge communities living in tents on the street, under the freeways, in the parks. And these are people like you and I who had one final slip up in their life and then they lose their place to live. They lose their family and they end up living in a tent on the street. And you multiply that by thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And that's what's happening here. And there's no safety net for those people. There's no empathy for those people. And it's, um, it's kind of horrific and amazing to see it uh, every day when you walk outside of your house. And so there's one song is about that. But let me say that a lot of the songs really are about one thing. And it goes back to what I was talking about before. It's about living in a world um that is brutal and unkind and unfair and um how do we make sense of that how did we get here how did we contribute to that how who is there to blame what's our own part in it and also like if you if you If you think about the effects that that has on a person, me, you, anybody, uh, spiritually and mental health-wise, and the stress and the fear and the anxiety and the trauma that people experience in this world, like, what is it all for? What is it all, what, you know, what's like... If you zoom out and you look at it, like, is this all just a human construct that we're supposed to be waking up and going to work and being contributing members of society so that what? So that we live some happy happiness in our life? Or or what if it's what if it's what if there is not that? What if it's empty? What if you go all the way down that rabbit hole looking for meaning in any of this and you don't find it? and you find nothing, then you're kind of fucked, right? You definitely and, are. Yeah. And so this is like, this is sort of like a place that I've gone in my mind. And it's something that it's a recurring thread through the songs is sort of like, 
how do we make meaning of this? And the only thing, the only positive reframe that I could come up with is that we are all in this together, you know, we are, we are all the same. It's the great equalizer. Uh, we are all in this sort of alienated existence together. And what we have done in our punk community is found each other and, and made our own place where we can express our art and our music, celebrate our um, like-mindedness, and we can we can build our own community based on the principles that we think are important. So like you- that's a long sentence to explain what this with this band and what a lot of these songs are are about that would you say that the community built the community that you built there would you say that it is based on our most common common humanity yeah i like that it's based on that which is often um neglected in conversations when it comes to um you know things like homelessness and mental health and things like that. Um, It's also based on our sort of outsider stance. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, it's, It's a choice you make. It doesn't choose you. You choose it to be to be on the outside of this society right uh in terms of our philosophy and our perspective and uh our ideals and our own moralistic code that we live by and our music and our art and you know when we talk about the music that you make and i had the pleasure of seeing you live with neurosis quite a few times, even traveled for the band. Um, I always loved watching you behind the keyboards because I always, I was always waiting for that one point that happened in every set that I saw. And it happened in literally every of the 11 sets that I saw. There was always a moment when you just totally didn't give an F about your keyboards and just basically whooped it over. (laughs) And I was like, I love the guy because he doesn't give a shit about the money. He doesn't give a shit about the instrument. He is only in it for the music. And he's in that music for himself. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I always had the feeling that when you are on stage, you're in it for yourself and you're in it for your own catharsis, which does not mean that you neglect the audience, but it's first of all your own catharsis. I'm in it. um, When I'm on stage, I'm in it in the moment. I'm in it for the moment. I'm in it for the music. And what I, you know, the neurosis is very special in this way that what we are all doing together is sort of sharing one mind in how we create this stuff. And to me, I just think it's, it's really beautiful and powerful and at times really heartbreaking and i'm just i'm just swimming through all of those emotions as we're creating this sound and filling the room 
So I'm just, I'm just swimming through the music, you know, and I'm in that moment and it's, it's, um, it's a very special thing to sort of feel free and flowing, mm -hmm. um, with what we're doing. And that's, that's where it comes from. Um, yeah, I lose myself and I, I abandon, you know, um, maybe some common sense <laughs> in the moments, but, uh, yeah, that's um, true. That, it sometimes looks like it. <laughs> uh, I miss uh, it. Well, you can all, I don't know if it will be the same when you, if, and when you go on tour with tension span, because you don't have a keyboard to hide behind. No, I'm going to have to play guitar and sing at the same time again. Um, Multitasking. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I grew are, up are doing there plans, that. Are there plans for touring with Tension Span? Um, I would like that. We're still talking about it. So we need to find a drummer um, and we need to actually sort of relearn the songs because unlike every other band I've ever been in where we write songs in a room together and we know how to play them mm. live before we yeah. even go and record it. Yeah. Most of the bands and records that I've made are basically all of that is written. Every neurosis record is done that way. Like we go in to Steve Albini's studio with the songs written with the tones dialed in with all of our parts, like crafted precisely the way we want them to be and we play it yeah. live and he captures that and then we add some vocals and some extra parts but that's mostly live so this record for tension span was the opposite it was it was creating music and layers using you know um computers at home and um and so that's the task that's ahead for us <laughs> is to is to grab our instruments, get in the same room together, and, and relearn the relearn the songs and play it. And I look forward to that because that's it's um it's in some ways that music is meant to be played live in a room. Yes. Right? It Definitely. just didn't Definitely. have the opportunity yet. So that's that's I'm going to make it happen, man. And then whether uh, or not we go on tour is that's just a life question. We just have to figure out yeah. how to do that. Yeah. Uh, when, when we already have been talking um, about your youth and about the way that you experienced the punk scene back then, of course, I cannot let you out of this interview with a few questions about that. I mean, like Gilman Street back in the day, how, how must we imagine that scene was it as anti-authoritarian as i would like it to have been um how do i answer that um gilman with how you experienced it <laughs> yeah well you know my band played we headlined the very first show at gilman street ever the very first show was on New Year's Eve of 1986. Okay. And Christ on Parade was the band. Okay. Um, so in the months leading up to that, we were all part of the uh, sort of the community outreach project to organize this new club. But I want to make it clear, this club was created to be a safe place for young people. Because in the all of the, you know, all of the years leading up to this, our punk scene was was very chaotic and very violent. And it was, you know, it was happening in places like Mabuhe Gardens, the on Broadway. We had our place in Berkeley called Ruthie's Inn. But it was um it was a bunch of wild, feral children and young adults who were, um, it was kind of Lord of the Flies, if that, you know what I mean, right? I know what you mean. And if it was that way, then it was brutal. Yeah, it was. It was scary. And it was, 
dangerous and um okay. you had to be very tuned in and aware of who was who and where they're standing and you know and cuz violence broke out spontaneously all the time and he didn't want to be caught in the middle of it you know and people were um there were also a lot of runaway kids a lot of um junkies a lot of scumbags it was sort of a magnet for a lot of like um sort of dark dirty hard ass people um and then there's people like me and david edwardson who are like 14 15 years old walking in the door wanting to experience sort of the magic and the power of this of this music and this scene that was so different from anything that came before it and so important like i i i have this memory man of like this what we're doing right now this is important this is a cultural movement. And I feel like maybe uh, most people at that age have some experience of their youth and their friends and their scene and their identity that they think was important. But maybe maybe it turns out it wasn't that. But I feel like this was. was. And we have enough hindsight now, 35 years later, to look down the road and see how it how the path laid itself out it was important it was it's still being talked about as important and it's still those bands are revered uh this yeah. many years later right so definitely and and so, not just neurosis but a lot of them yeah a lot of them a lot of them um and uh that was you know so Gilman Street happened as a response to sort of the chaotic and violent nature of the scene, wanting to make it more, uh, mo wanting to make it more positive and more organized and more together in an effort where it could be a safe place um, and an accepting place. And, um, and that's sort of how how it was born. So let's say let's not say that it was full of anti-authoritarian squatters like you have in Europe, because it was more. <laughs> yes, born, we do. Yeah, we yeah. do. I'm just. We have it was more born of uh, of you know young people, um, teenagers, who are finding their way into this world, and wanting to be a part of it. Um, and not wanting to get their ass kicked for no reason all the time, you know? Um, there was anti-authoritarian stuff happening. It, was, it wasn't it was necessarily happening at Gilman Street. Um, the warehouse where Christ on Parade and Neurosis were born from, it was a place called New Method Warehouse, and it was filled with punks and artists and musicians who were what we call, uh, we call it a rent strike, but they were basically refusing to pay rent, living in these um, moldy little um, put together um, living spaces in a warehouse. And then we, we started doing punk shows there. We would just sort of like knock a hole in the wall and invite everybody in. And uh, so that stuff was all done word of mouth, completely illegally. Um, and uh, some of the best shows happened in that in that space. Um, you know, there was a lot of other things going on. It was just sort of the older crowd that were sort of pushing the sort of the more serious, like true anarchistic um, side of punk rock back then, you know. Um, local bands for us, like we had, we had Flipper, you know, uh, <laughs> very much like, very much like anti music, you know, uh, in a way, very yeah. successful in its um, way, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But that kind of like art punk, you know, yeah. um, 
but all of this was happening in in very sort of like DIY underground spaces, you know, and they none of them lasted very long, but there would be a new one around the corner. Um, but Gilman Street was different. Gilman Street was one building on one street where you can walk into and you know that you can um, be a part of a community where everybody's working together on this sort of larger, more uh, sort of punk utopian idea of of like togetherness, you know, and uh, it's it certainly had its problems, you know, it invited lots of skinheads and there were big fights and, um, you know, uh, but it it held true to its its original path and its purpose, which was to be a place that was inclusive and safe and volunteer run. And where people were invested in it for uh, for each other, and and you know it wasn't as much of a just a crazy, dark, chaotic place that punk used to occupy. Would you say that when we're talking about Gilman Street, and we're talking about a place, but we music-wise, we cannot talk about one scene, right? No. That's something that was really true, especially then, was that punk was not one scene. It was, it was, um, was it, it was an accepting of, well, it was accepting of anything that was sort of creative and artistic and different, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, some of it was performance art, some of it was, um, noise so you know um some of it was straight up punk yeah some of it was and that was one of the things that was a very divisive thing actually was that tim yohannan who who was sort of the key one of the key people in starting gilman street he was um one of the key people from maximum rock and roll magazine and radio mm -hmm. show and he liked his punk a very specific way Three chords and a cloud of dust, right? And less venom. And, uh, yeah. And, um, you know, then you get all these different types of bands coming in. And, um, in, you know, in some ways he was accepting of that. And in some ways he was disapproving of that. Um, when neurosis sort of evolved from pain of mind into word as law into... Souls Soul at zero. zero. Oh my God! There's keyboards, and then he was like, "No, you can't. You guys, I don't want. I don't want you to play my punk club anymore." Um, it was yeah. There was a lot of that going on. People trying to figure out what the identity was, you know. But you know, they got through it. They got through it. Now let's imagine what he must have felt as soon as Green Day published Dookie. Yeah, heart right? attack. Heart, heart attack. attack. Right? <laughs> yeah yeah spinning in his grave yeah um if it i remember i mean but that was the thing back then it's like so green day was playing the same shows as neurosis and christ on parade and operation ivy and crimp shrine and yeah. filth and blats and yeah. sam i am and soup and all these bands all very different sounding um Capital Punishment was one from Sacramento. We had this cool, almost quirky prog band called Victim's Family, who are amazing. Um, but anyway, all these different types of music happening there all the time. Every band that came through would get to play there. You know, Fugazi played there. One of my favorites, a band called Decroitson, would play there. They were they were very cool and very different. Another singular band, right? Nobody sounds like De Kreutzen. Yes. Um, but then... You, uh, by, by the way, would you say that singular bands are nowadays rarer than in the 80s? I hope not. I, I would like to think that I'm just not paying attention in the right places, but I'm not finding them myself. Well, I want to have some. I, I can give you a little web there. scene which will show you the singular bands. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> I bet you can. <laughs> well, we do our best. Well, we do our best. Yeah. Um, I have anyway. So that's that's the that's what Gilman Street is, and and what it became. But but you know, I remember you know Green Day were a few years younger than us. Um, Operation Ivy was, you know, a big deal. Uh, they were our friends who really brought brought the scene together in a in a positive way. Yeah. Um, Green Day was also very divisive when they got that kind of popularity, and and they made the choice to to step outside of the independent world. Yeah. Um, Although but, we have to agree that there has always in the music of Green Day there has always been that pop appeal that catches. yeah exactly. And to be honest, like back then, I hated that stuff. I just thought like I was writing songs about identity crisis. I was, you know, and this dark cloud that I'm that we're all trying to walk through and how, you know, emotional and depressive and dark that those feelings are, you know, is more and they like are writing songs about going to Pasalacqua. Yeah, they're they're writing songs about girls and cigarettes and everything's neat you know and i was like that's not punk rock you know and what's interesting though is that if you flash forward years later they're one of the very few bands that became more punk over time you know the things way, that they definitely. were tackling you know yeah. yeah uh as opposed to many bands who started off punk and became less punk and more pop yeah, yeah. they started off pop and became more punk but you know who who That's knew? just an observation. Who knew? Who knew? But, uh, you know, I knew them. I mean, I know them. I run into them around town. We all sort of grew up together playing the same shows together. And I'm honestly, um, if I'm, if I'm being honest, I'm, I'm always kind of proud of them. Or whatever. I that's wouldn't for. expect anything else of you. I have, <laughs> Uh, two more questions before we come to our infamous and you might say divisive, <laughs> divisive <laughs> quickfire round. Uh, okay. First of all, how must I imagine a university program for audio engineering and music production? Is it very theoretical or is it focused totally on doing it? Because if What? anybody doesn't know... Uh, Noah has a university degree in audio engineering and music production. I do. I do. I've never been asked this question before. So thank you. So is it is it very theoretical or is it more focused on doing it? Well, they tried to do both. Keep in mind, this is in the early 90s, right when digital audio was beginning to happen. But the studio at the university that we learned on still had tape machines. Two-inch, 24-track, reel-to-reel, multi-track tape machines. And we learned how to align them and how to operate them. Um, it was an analog world still. And this new thing was happening, which would become Pro Tools. And so I was right on the edge where I learned the old stuff and then later had to learn the new stuff which they're all just tools to accomplish beautiful sounding recordings. It's, it's all fine. I don't, I mean, I love it all. So, but, but um, I will say what they taught me in school, they taught, they had this idea that there's a right way to do this that here's where you put a microphone for the kick drum and here's where you put one for the snare and here's the signal path that you use and here's the level that you record it at. And then as soon as I got out of school, I realized none of that is true, that there are no limits. I had to unlearn the things that they were telling me is the way to do things so that I could relearn it myself and being more experimental and more creative with my approach to recording. Because all that really matters is what you like in your ears, mm, right? Definitely. And, and so if you give yourself that freedom, oh my God, it's so much more fun. 
and it's so much more rewarding and it's so much more creative and the result is so much more unique. And so that's the approach that I've had for all these years of being a sound recording engineer is to, um, is to uh, not have a, a ceiling in terms of how you're supposed to do it. There is no right way. There are some wrong ways. I'll tell you that. But there is no right way. There are many right ways. Um, I'm lucky enough to have recorded with Steve Albini many times now. And um, every single time, it's one of my favorite things I've ever been lucky enough to do but every single time i'm just like a sponge i just want to absorb all of the knowledge and that's one of the things that i really learned from watching him is that um is that you get to make your own choices the whole way through and um and he's not somebody who's gonna like tell you that there's a certain way to do things he's just mm. gonna work with you to capture what you bring into the room and that's the approach that i've had with all the bands that i recorded since then okay as you've now already dropped albini a second time before my van very last question i have to ask that because being somebody who also loves playing pool and also has his own <laughs> pool table at home is it is the urban legend true that albini has his carambolage pool table at electrical audio um, it's a, yes, it's, but it's, it's, I don't know enough about it, but you, you probably do. It's a pool table without corners and pockets. Yeah. It's a pool table without pockets. So is that snooker? No, it's carambolage. Carambolage. Okay. Where, where um, you hit one ball first and then before the play ball then, hits the second ball, it has to, has to go over it has three to get two, sides. Two. Okay. Two, three two. sides. Two or three. Okay, you know, yeah. three. But it's yeah, true yeah. that he has the table in oh, electrical yeah. audio. Yeah. yeah, he taught us how to play it uh, one time. Um, and uh, it, his place is very, very cool. It's, um, it's designed for bands and musicians to come stay for several days there's little almost like dorm rooms down the hallway with a bed you know so where so yeah. and we always go in the winter time when um uh between christmas and new years because steve von till is a school teacher so that's the only time he gets off right i know that's also why he only tours in summer <laughs> yeah that's right we tour in the summer and we record over over winter break so we go to chicago but he's teaching elementary school right yeah, yeah, yeah. He loves it. He loves it. I think he teaches fourth grade now. Um, but uh, it's always snowing and freezing. And so we just, we take one trip to the grocery store and we get a week's worth of groceries and we go back in the studio and we close the door and we never leave. <laughs> and that's why there's things like a pool table and, you know, a whole wall full of movies to watch uh, just for when you need to get a break from working on your album. Okay. You know, so. Okay. It's... Last question before we come to the cookware round. Uh, is it true that, or is my research correct, that you worked on the recording of a few video game soundtracks? And if it's yes. true, how must I imagine recording a soundtrack for a video game? Okay. Do you have to play well, it? it? It's uh, it's interesting. That's a good question because I'm not really a video game person. I'm not a gamer. I have to play it enough so that I can know if it works. But the way it all started was uh, an old friend of mine. His name is Mike Moraski, and he had a band called Steel Pole Bathtub. I don't Ooh. know if you remember them. I do. Yeah, they were pretty special. Very noisy art punk uh loud i always remember it whatever i yeah. heard by them was loud yeah and they had lots of cool samples and a very noisy guitar yeah. anyway they were friends of neurosis and we did many shows and tours together he grew up to become a music composer 
And I grew up to become a sound recording engineer. Mm -hmm. And um, he started writing music, orchestral music, for like zombie games, like end of humanity, dark, you know, video game music. The fun stuff. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, and then he would ask me to help him record it. So I would book the studio and I would hire symphony players to come in and he'd give them all sheet music and we'd watch the video of what it's, of what the music is going to be played uh, with. And, um, and everyone would learn their parts. We would do it in sections. We would do the strings, violin, viola. We'd do the low strings with the cello and the bass. And we would do percussion and we would do brass and we would put it all together. And, um, and my job was to mix it and put it in the game. And, um, and then, you know, we play it and make sure it works and make sure it's adequately spooky or scary or dark or industrial or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, I was mostly his, he was the creative mind and I was his technician to help make it happen. Um, and so we did that for many years, many years, many games. Um, he works for a company called Valve and uh, they did a game called uh, Left for Dead. That's the zombie one. Yeah. Um, he did a game, we did all the music for, uh, Team Fortress 2, which is sort of a little bit more of a cartoon military game. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, all of these are incredibly popular, man. There, there are literally 10 million people probably playing it right now. Like whatever, whatever the game is that they're playing, it's, it's, Way more people have heard the music I've recorded and mixed and produced for these video games than I've ever heard any of the original music that I've done, that I've spent my whole life and heart and emotion and put you into You should it. have gotten into Green Day, then. We might discuss that. <laughs> yeah. So, Noah, no. first of all, thanks for all these incredible answers. But... As I have somebody here who needs to get to bed at some point yeah. later. Um, let's go to our infamous quickfire round. And I'll give you two old Yeah, I'm, you two. I'm Google sorry first. if I if I just if I just go on and on, and this is probably no, 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 way no. too much for anybody to want to listen to the whole thing. So feel free to edit. No, things. we always it's always a one take. Believe me, uh, okay. we've had longer ones. Oh, good. And whoever okay. listens to this podcast knows he has to take his time or her time. <laughs> I'll give you two alternatives and you have to choose and maybe give a short explanation why you chose this or okay. that. All right. Uh, let's start off with something simple. Remotes versus television. Television. That's a, Sex. that's a good question. Wait, that's a good question. I mean, the Ramones hats off to them and they're, entire long lived legacy and story um you know television has one album that i just Marquee think of is so special so definitely yeah i would agree on the fact that when we look for hits then the, the ramones are the way to go if you look for one cohesive album then none of the ramones albums ever beats marky moon sorry yeah yeah Sex Pistols versus The Clash. That's a good one. These are all very good. Um, I would uh, I would pick The Clash, uh, mostly because they had a longer span of being creative uh, yeah. recording artists, and they also uh, explored a lot more different areas and different types yeah. of music. Yeah. You know, Sandinista is incredible. Um, I still play London Calling often, you know. Yeah. Just as a go-to record. And also a good record for anybody who wants to get into punk. Uh, yeah. Dead Kennedys or The Circle Jerks should be easy. I, uh, even though I'm from the Bay Area, uh, Circle Jerks, I, I pick them. Just I just, they're, oh man, their sound and Keith Morris's voice, um, 
it's it's the stuff that has been imprinted in my brain and it, it just stuck there in a way that dead Kennedy's didn't dead Kennedy's did for many people was that sound and that thing that's imprinted in their brain. But for me, uh, wild in the streets, uh, all, you know, there's, there's, there's something about, maybe it's because when I was very young, I saw a decline of Western civilization and there's the early footage of, of them and that energy. I, I just fell in love with it. So circle jerks. Bauhaus versus New Order. And I'm not giving you Joy Division. Bauhaus okay. versus New Order. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Um, because otherwise, I guess that nobody would ever pick anything but Joy Division. So Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say Bauhaus. Uh, sonically noisier. Um, in some ways, like, they don't give a fuck that much. Uh, whereas... New Order was very sort of precise and a little pretty in the way that it was all played. And I can appreciate that. But um, Bauhaus was more emotionally uh, impactful to me. Like, and I, you know what? I imagine Peter Murphy, I don't want to get in trouble with this, but might not be the nicest person to hang out with. Um, Heard that too. Yeah, right. I don't know. May, I've never had him over for dinner. But um, uh, but uh, some of the stories I've heard. Um, but that aside, you know, who knows what people are like in in their personalities. But uh, musically, that stuff was powerful and important to me. Now, two bands that you do know personally, and I'm talking about, let's say, late '80s, early '90s. For both bands, who would you rather play at home on your record player? Green Day or Sam I Am? Green Day. Yeah, um, I know okay. that's a big. That's that. These could be surprising answers, but um, uh, also they because they they've had a longer. Uh, catalog of music that they've done and um mm -hmm. ever since like american idiot and and 21st century breakdown i thought those were really good albums um i thought they're well constructed sonically the the tonality the production the um i i don't know here's here's I don't want to be too long-winded about this, but honestly, I believe them. I th that's how I that's that's what I the ruler I use to measure music. Do I believe this person? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, Billy Joe is somebody that I know, but I believe him. You know, when when he is sort of pouring his heart out, um, I don't doubt his um, the sincerity of the place where it comes from. Although I got to admit for everybody who's listening and who has not done so, the first two tracks that I heard of the new Semi Am stuff will be mind-blowing. Oh, good. I, I haven't I heard, heard it. it. I heard it live like three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Really? Yeah, they played a show with like Hot Water Music, Be Well, Semi Am, and one of probably my island bands ever, Boys That's Fire. And uh, Semi Am played... Among a lot, of course, of the great ones, you know, like Capsized and, and Dull and yeah. and all that stuff. They also played two new tracks, and they are really, really good. Next question. Oh, good. Susie or Blondie? Oh, man. That's a great one. Um, the young me would pick Blondie. Um. Uh, the young me listened to a lot of Blondie and a lot of um, B-52s, things like that, right? Ooh, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, and, I, and I will always have a love for that. But I think the older me has to has to choose Susie. Um, there's something, something sort of more serious um and heartfelt about the way she writes her songs 
I have to admit, Mr. Landis, this, this might have been the most eloquent and most clever way of ever avoiding an or question in any of my <laughs> interviews. Okay. Converge or Dillinger escape plan? And those That's are two question. singular bands for me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I have in my place a heart for Converge, so I'll choose them. We spent some time on the road with them and got to really be close to them. Uh, and, you know, when you have a relationship of, of real friendship with people, yeah, course, it right. might that taint changes. your vision. So, yes. Coming to you yourself. Um, I know that you like literature. And I did not want to choose E.E. E. Cummings versus anybody. <laughs> But I chose two of his influences, Ezra Pound versus Gertrude Stein. Wow. Um, I think I would pick Gertrude Stein, but I, I'm, you know, I'm not a strong, strongly one or the other. That's a hard one. I mean, it's a, it's a, the question almost imagines one of them not existing, right? Mm. I don't know if that's the way you intend these questions to be. Like, no, I don't. No, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I would also have chosen Gertrude Stein um, because, to me, the things she's written or she, the things she wrote, so, the things she wrote were always a little bit more appealing to me because they had. A little bit more of introspectiveness about it. And that is mm -hmm. something that I really liked in her stuff. The next two guys might not have been the nicest ones, but they were highly influential in literature. Hemingway or Steinbeck? It's another really difficult one. I'll pick Steinbeck, though. I was I young when I read this. When I read Steinbeck and that stuff, I just have, I have mental images of those stories and the way my own mind has made them up to look and feel that are still with me. So, But you do know about Hemingway having written the shortest short story ever. No, tell me. Uh, legend has it. I mean, like the fact that he wrote that short story is true, but the legend around it has it that he's once again sitting in Key West at the bar and the barkeeper and owner of a bar tells him, you won't get any more to drink. And Hemingway was like, well, I'll bet you a thousand dollars that I can write a short story with a beginning, a main part, and an ending on a beer coaster. <laughs> and the owner is like, easy one, you can't. So Hemingway sits there, scribbles on the beer coaster, and a few minutes later, he gives the beer coaster to the guy. And he's written six words on it. Baby shoes, full stop. For sale, full stop. Never used. That's it. That's it. But the mental image that we develop in our head behind it is not six words, but 6,000 words, right? Yeah. Last two ones. Yeah. What do you enjoy more at the moment? Not all in all, but at the moment. Playing the keyboards or delivering a vocal performance? Right they now, occupy today, different parts. They occupy different parts of my brain. Um, okay. Delivering a... D delivering a vocal moment right now yeah okay uh, although i miss i miss playing the keyboards um in that band the way that we play you know i miss that right now a lot it's been a, a difficult transition uh time in my life but um what can we do? We can move forward and we can bring our creativity through the world and other channels. Talking about creativity, what would be more appealing right now for you? Writing and recording new stuff 
or touring with tension span? Right now, touring. I would love to be in a room, uh, just, you know, open my voice and let it out with all of the, you know, all of the pent up emotional stuff I've been feeling in this particular time in my life. I think that would be the most healing satisfying and rewarding thing I could do right now would be to go on tour and play. I don't care how small the room is or how few the people are. I would, I would, um, I would find that very fulfilling and healing. I can imagine. So Noah, usually I do not end my interviews with a quote from somebody else than my interview partner. But I think there is one that fits very well to all, a lot of the things that we have mentioned. And it's a quote by a musician from England that I really like, Frank Turner, who once wrote a chorus that I think applies to these times a lot. When he wrote, in a world that has decided that it's bound to lose its mind, be more kind, my friend. Try to be more kind. Noah, thanks a lot for this very, very interesting, telling, and highly rewarding interview. It was my pleasure. Thank you.